Hello folks, Captain Jerry Dillsaver here and welcome back to the second video of the 2021 Oak Island Saltwater Fishing School video series. As you know, COVID's kept us from getting together this year so we're trying to put some stuff out. Uh, hopefully to help you catch some more fish and today we're going to talk about king mackerel fishing, specifically the slow trolling type of king mackerel fishing. Um, there, there are in the spring some small kings that mix with Spanish and we want to be sure you know the difference between a small king and a large Spanish. It's really pretty simple. Now the Division of North Carolina Marine Fisheries has this on their website and we're going to have it in a slide later on. But the thing you really need to watch for is this black spot on the front of the small leading dorsal fin. A Spanish mackerel has that black spot, a king mackerel doesn't. Yet there are other differences. The lateral line in a Spanish gradually drops, where in a king it takes a, a quick dip. Uh, there are some teeth and head and whatever differences. But this is going to be the one that stands out to most people. And the odds are it's going to be the one that the fisheries man looks for if he checks you. So know the difference between a king and a Spanish. Now, our live bait slow trolling, from the very nature of the name, is for live baits. Uh, for those live baits, we're going to use a lot of pogies or menhaden if you're not used to the word pogies, bluefish, blue runners, mullets. Oh man, I've used a little bit of everything at times when we got desperate. We also use some dead baits. And the one we're going to talk about mixed in this spread today is ribbon fish. They are a long silver eel, uh, caught close to shore and inshore, um, and king mackerel eat them. And that's what we need to know. They, they do come and eat them. Now, slow trolling means just that. Everybody says how fast. Let me give you a range of maybe one and a half to two knots for your trolling speed and rather than be locked into that whether you're using the speed on your fish finder or your GPS occasionally look back at your lines behind the boat if the lines to the surface baits are always tight you're going a little too fast those baits need a little bit of slack in the line so they can swim around a little bit and look more natural so slow down until you get that little bit of slack in the line and of course it goes without saying if your baits are passing the boat you'll probably need to speed up a little bit now two rigs we're going to talk about and you will have slides of these with the details but the first is our basic king mackerel rig it's a piece of wire about five feet back to a nose hook that i like to use a treble hook for then about five and a half inches back to a second treble hook um, that is hooked the back or the belly of the bait. Some people let it dangle. I prefer to hook it back by the anal vent. Um, that way if a fish comes up and, and hits, it's there in his mouth. If you've got a huge bait, add a third hook. Don't make the distance too much in here. For this rig, you can use number four or number five single strand wire, uh, 40, 45 pound stranded wire, whichever you can buy. Um, stranded wire is a little easier to work with. The single strand wire is a little more tooth proof. The second rig we're gonna work with today is a ribbon fish rig. Again, a wire rig, stranded or single strand. We use a piece of wire about five feet back and to some sort of nose hook, I like to use a one ounce butter bean bucktail here. It stabilizes that dead bait, plus in the rocking motion of the boat, that flat sided uh, butter bean jig will move to the side a little bit. And then when the line comes tight, it'll pull it back in and it'll send a ripple down that fish like it's still alive, but barely. It makes it easy prey. So I really like this bait. Now the first gap here is going to be nine inches back to this hook. That's to get down the head and past the gills of the ribbon fish. And then 
add extra hooks, two or three, to get most of the way down the side of the ribbon fish, them five, five and a half, six inches apart. Now, brown wire here, I like to use everything behind the jig, either as silver or gray. You can find silver wire, you can find silver hooks, you can find some gray hooks. Uh, to make your wire gray, you're going to need to spray it with some spray paint. But these are good fish catching uh, uh, rigs. They're down in the spread. They, they sometimes bring fish into the spread that actually hit the other baits. I've had guys say, oh man, I never catch anything on a ribbon fish. Why do you insist on using them? Because they're big. They're long, they're tall, they're flashy. They get stuff's attention from away, bring it into the spread, and you catch it. Or you get a strike and get a chance to catch it. Let's take a little break here. And when we come back, we're going to talk about my prospecting rig. And you'll see how setting it up really helps you catch more kings. Okay, welcome back. I hope you will find those slides that you saw during our video break helpful to you. We're going to go in. Now you've got it up here big. You're also going to have in your slides a sheet like this that tells a little bit more information about this spread. This is what I call my prospecting spread. And it's what I put out when I get to an area I haven't seen, I haven't marked the school of bait or anything on the fish finder yet. I'm fishing a rock, a wreck, uh, a tide line, whatever I'm fishing. And I have not seen those bait marking, so I'm going to put this over to start with. The surface lines will always be the same like this. If, as I pull up, I mark some bait... On the fish finder I will adjust the downrigger lines so that one is just a few feet under that pot of bait and one is just a few feet over that pot of bait now in the links back here I'm going to be talking about feet and I'm going to mention the word pulls a pull is simple a pull is from the top of your reel to the first guide. Most rods, it's gonna be, well, and this is upside down, but you can read it. It's gonna be right at 22 inches. Not quite two feet, but when we're counting it, we're gonna count it as two feet. And every tenth pull, I pull another one just to make up those inches that we've missed. Now, I will work this this way and I will caution you when you're putting out baits whenever it is possible start with the bait furthest behind the boat and work closer to the boats. Live baits school to protect themselves and if you're trying to draft or to drop one back by another he may not want to go by him. They don't have real big brains, but they know if there's one bait, they're by themselves and a predator swims up, guess who's going to get eaten? If there's two of them, the odds are 50-50 that it's going to be him, not me. If there are three, those odds get even better with a 33% chance it's going to be me and 66 it's going to be one of them. So bait tends to school. Put the long lines out first work back to the boat. Okay, let's talk about this spread. I call it my prospecting spread because every line is in its place for a very specific reason. There are surface lines that are staggered at distances behind the boat. There are downrigger lines that are up and down in the column at certain depths 
And the way this is laid out, it's a pretty maneuverable spread. You can turn to the right 90 degrees, and in the length of your longest line, when it comes straight, turn to the right again. So if you go over the rock, wreck, ledge, a big school of bait, whatever, and want to get back to them quickly, you can turn to the right and get back quicker. To the left, you can probably only turn about 60 degrees, and it's going to take you a little longer to get turned and get back to them. So where are these lines that are so important? Well, let's start here with the longest one. You build this spread from the furthest bait away from the boat back to the boat. And so the longest line is going to be number one. It's also on your, your slide. It's going to be 100 feet back. We talked about pulls. That's going to be 50 to 60 pulls. And I'm going to look in that live well, and I'm going to find the largest live bait I've got in there. A big bluefish, a big pogey. I've had luck with mullets back there. I want a big bait sitting back behind everything that looks like he's paying attention to the spread in front of him. The next longest line, and this is placed off the T-top. It's not on an outrigger, but it's off the T-top holder so that the line runs straight from the rod tip to the hooks. I don't like outriggers for live bait style fishing. Next longest line on the boat is going to be off the left or port side. It's going to be 75 to 80 feet back. That's 40 to 45 pulls. A medium live bait there. Not a huge one, but a nice bait. And this is where I'll put some color in the spread, a skirt of some type. I'm not the biggest fan of skirts. I know that they catch some fish from time to time. Um, the largest king I've ever caught on a skirt was 35 pounds. Uh, but this is where I'm going to put that. Um, I mean, think about it. You've caught a lot of bait. If, you, if you've been fishing for a while, you throw that cast net, you catch hundreds at a time. You ever caught one that had a little rubber thingy or a, a mylar thingy on its nose no you didn't so that's why i don't put a whole lot of skirts in the spread but i do put one on this next to the longest line now i go to downriggers next and i fish a deep downrigger and a shallow downrigger both of those are going to be the bait's going to be dropped back 20 to 25 feet and then clipped into the downrigger release off my starboard or right side is my deep one and it's going to be two-thirds of the way to the bottom uh don't want it all the way down but want it pretty deep i'm going to put a ribbon fish there that's where they live ribbon fish dwell in the bottom third of the water column that's where i'm going to put him come to my shallow down rigger which is off the port side and will be the fourth line i put out it's going to go a third of the way to the bottom and i'm going to try to find a pretty large bait for it not as big as the one that goes back here, but a nice size bait. Now, I come to the final two lines. They're behind the boat. Behind the motor that is still running. If you only have a single engine, it's going to be behind the motor. If you got two, three, four, or five, it's going to be behind the one that's still running. You want it back far enough that the prop wash is not pushing it around every time you turn the wheel. So it's going to be 30 feet, maybe 40 feet if you've got a big motor, but you want it back there. It's on the surface and I'll put a double bait in this position. And that double bait is a basic King mackerel rig with a shortened version of that attached to it so that there are two baits within a, a foot and a half or so of each other back there. And if a predator swims up behind them, and they get nervous, it tends to excite him even more because there's two of them there. Then the shortest line on the boat behind the motor that I've shut off, or if you only have one motor just off to the side of it, but I want it right behind the boat, like 10 feet back. Um, sometimes I'll pull this so close that I'll put a small egg sinker in front of the swivel to hold it down so that it isn't pulling up. But I want that bait there. These fish are not afraid of your boat. They're not afraid of your motor. And they'll come right up to it. I want a bait there. A nice looking bait. Doesn't have to be huge. Um, 
but I want that there when that curious fish swims up behind it. So, okay. What are we accomplishing with this? Why do I call it the prospecting rig? Got two things going for it to help you adjust. First, pay attention to your GPS. Every time you have a strike, hit the man over button. You're fishing a rock, a ledge, or something, and you're circling or walking back, working back and forth across it, you typically will see that the majority of your strikes come at a certain point. Maybe it's a wreck and they're all to the southwest side. You've had five strikes there, one over here, one over here, one over here. Well, then you want to concentrate on being in this area. That's where the fish are at that particular piece of structure that day. And the other thing is carry a number two pencil. And every time you have a strike, write down on your console with that pencil where it is. RL, write long. RD, write down. PW, prop wash. PW2, prop wash 2. Uh, LL, long left. Make names for your lines that you'll know and just make that indentation and list them down on your console. You may well see that on any given day, the, the fish are going to prefer baits that are in a certain location in your spread. Now, is that this long one? If it is, drop it 10 feet further back and drop this one to 10 feet shorter than it. <coughs> if it's your deep downrigger, drop it down 10 more feet and drop your shallow downrigger down to where it's just above it. If they're hitting up behind the boat, pull this one short. If they're hitting that medium, drop, drop this one back a little bit and drop this one back to it. Try to get your you're paying attention and you're trying to get more baits where the fish are biting that day. It's my prospecting rig or prospecting spread, and it does help me. I promise you that keeping track of where your strikes come from and working to get more baits in those areas will help you catch more fish. Till the next video. Good fishing to you.